fill five million and it just adds that project to the existing five million and says to staff, get it all done. It also says in part two was the amendment offered by Councillor Sanderson that staff come back and tell us how we might scope and use the reallocation of those funds to address uh, the alternate funding sources or uh, looking at the 2011 budget. So there's a number of options open by passing clause two. Okay, okay, so the, the, um, oh. okay, so let's take the, can we take the vote on one and two first? Members of council, a recorded vote has been requested on what's identified as motion A, parts clauses one and two. All those in favor of the motion, please show you're in favor by rising. Showing in favor is Councillor Miles, Mayor Fennell, Councillor Hutton, Councillor Squivieri, Councillor Dillon, and Councillor Sanderson. All those against, please show by rising. Showing against uh, clauses one and two are Councillor Moore, Councillor Gibson, and Councillor Callahan. Madam Mayor, uh, parts one and two of that motion carry. Thank you. The Pardon me? So we have split it now, so we do have to now vote on part three. And part three now is approving the uh, all of the projects within the five million, which now include the John James Piccadilly Piccadilly. Recorded vote has been requested. All those in favor of part three of motion A, please stand to be counted. Yes. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, it's identified as part five of motion of clause three of that motion. So if you look at part five, it says gateways and CN rail underpass improvements for 3.03 million, including downtown gateways, King Street underpass, Main Street underpass, and the realignment of James Street and John Street at the CN rail crossing. Why doesn't it? Councillor, because the original motion asked us to get it all done by working within that funding envelope. <laughs> and we need further clarification how we use five million for one more project. You're on the list. I need to ask, um, I guess I need to ask staff if, if section three is defeated, what happens? And Th through you, Madam Mayor, um, clause three, as I understand, is there because the motion to reopen the $5 million was specific to the unspent funds. And as staff have pointed out, there are unspent funds in various components of those five million, of that $5 million um, allocation. So this, in effect, closes up the $5 million by reconfirming all the projects um, that have been reopened through the previous notice of motion, including the reallocation of the required funds for the realignment of James Street, John Street. Okay. I mean, yeah. okay. The recorded vote has been requested on Clause 3 of Motion A. All those in favor, please uh, stand to be shown in favor. Showing in favor is Councillor Miles, Councillor Moore, Councillor Gibson, Mayor Fennell, Councillor Hutton, Councillor Squivieri, Councillor Dillon, and Councillor Sanderson. All those against, please stand to be counted. Showing against the motion is Councillor Callahan. Madam Mayor, part three of motion A carries. Thank you. Um, Mr. Clerk, could we then bring forward part B, which is the actual report on the John James that has been referred, referred, and referred, and it is now here. And the motion is that the alternate alignment for John James as set out in the report, as described, uh, now be the selected alignment and that that is now in the funding envelope that was just approved. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, it's a recorded vote, so I thought you were doing that, sorry. A recorded vote has been requested on what's identified as motion B, parts one, two, and three. All those in favor, please stand to be counted in favor. Showing in favor of the 
motion is Councillor Miles, Councillor Moore, Councillor Gibson, Mayor Fennell, Councillor Hutton, Councillor Scrovieri, Councillor Dillon, Councillor Sanderson. All those against, please stand to be counted. Showing against the motion is Councillor Callahan. Madam Mayor, the motion carries. Thank you, thank you, Council. That was um, a good debate, and good debates are always welcome at this Council. So by the approval, we said get one more project out of that five million. Thank you for seeing that as a priority, finally. The next, oh. Council, I do need a motion to receive the two delegations of Mr. Kutrizola and Mr. Harmsworth. It's moved by Councillor Sanderson, seconded by Councillor Dillon. All those in favor? Thank you, that's carried. We now move to The correspondence motions of L2 and L3 as it relates to uh, earlier matters. All those in favor of receipt of the correspondence L1, L, pardon me, L2 and L3. All those in favor? Thank you. That's carried. Councillor Moore, you added item P1. The floor is yours. Did you turn it on or did I? He's doing everything. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Mayor. I think it's appropriate um, for staff to update council on um, the process and the procedures that our staff and animal services employ um, as a way to identify and seize dogs in the community. And I understand there's things we can't talk about, but I do think it is important for us to get the clarification that we need and the understanding that we need uh, in terms of how our animal services staff uh, undertake the work they do in the community. That's a question regard. raised under new business. Commissioner Lowry or Mr. Grant, will you? Uh, I, I guess to be more specific, and, I, and in fairness, because that's a pretty open-ended question. Um, uh, as we, we have certain requirements under the legislation with respect to the, is it DOLA? Yeah, the DOLA? Dog the dog right. Sorry, the Dog Owners Liability Act. So my, my question is specific in terms of how do we identify and how do we respond uh, in terms of undertaking our responsibilities with that legislation? Uh, is it done on a complaint basis? Is it done on a proactive basis? Is it done, um, so that, that's what I'm trying to understand. To answer that question uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I can outline the legislation and then Perhaps Mr. Lowry can talk about standard practice. Um, the legislation does identify and defines a uh, pit bull, if that's your question. And it refers to various types of dogs, such as pit bull terrier, Strat Staffordshire pit bull terrier, and the list goes on. And it includes a dog that has an appearance and physical characteristics that are substantially similar to those dogs referred to in any of those clauses. And then further down in the legislation, uh, it gives the court some guidance by saying in determining whether a dog is a pit bull within the meaning of this act, a court may have regard to the breed standards established for, and it lists the various breeds being Staffordshire, Bull Terrier, etc. cetera. Um, and I won't read the whole legislation, but to say that that's the gist of it. Okay. And the uh, process, um, I can assure you that it's a normal process for us. Um, and our, our emphasis is protecting the community. Um, we don't target um, any particular um, area or breed or um, what have you. Our main concern is the, is, is the well-being of the public and also the well-being of the animal. Um, it's, it's a hard question to answer because there's some specifics um, related to, but we have a um, um, we have a, uh, a team of uh, animal control officers that do routine patrols. Uh, we look at uh, neighborhoods. We 
uh, sell licenses in neighborhoods as, while they're out on patrol, but essentially there's no targeting. It is essentially we are enforcing a legislation that is put upon us by the uh, province of Ontario. Okay, I understand That's that. as specific as I can, I can be at this time. Um, I, I guess, um, so could you walk me through one of those scenarios? If, uh, if uh, so our animal patrol officers do door-to-door -door canvassing to sell licenses, and through that process, so is that correct? Is that a correct statement? Uh, when they, uh, if they have time during a patrol or a mid-screen call, uh, one of the things we ask them to do is sell licenses. Okay, so if they um, are at a residence and they are um, inquiring as to whether or not the homeowner wants to buy a, a license for their dog and they um, make an observation that the dog either is a pit bull or certainly has characteristics that would lead them to believe that it is a pit bull. What is the process that unfolds from that point forward? Um, essentially, if it's identified as per the legislation, um, the dog would be identified, uh, an attempt would be made to sell a temporary license, and the onus becomes uh, the uh, dog owner's responsibility to uh, to demonstrate that it doesn't meet the criteria uh, under uh, as per, as per the uh, legislation that is or is not a pit bull, and we seize the dog. Uh, at what, well, you sell a temporary license. At what point would you seize the dog? Uh, if we during that period of time where you're waiting for the the correct. information to be. That's correct. Just to, to add to that, if, if there is a situation where uh, a staff member was of the belief that uh, there existed uh, a dog that is illegal under the Act, then, then there would be a requirement and a duty upon that staff member to, to act on that belief that the dog is illegal. Okay, if the, if the dog owner produces documentation um, what is the process if our staff wish to challenge the, the documentation that's provided or um, question its validity? And what is, where is the animal during that period of time? We maintain care and control of the animal until... Uh, generally speaking, again, uh, Councillor, under the Act, there are a couple of provisions that, uh, that restrict staff to some degree. One is in terms of identification of a pit bull. And again, if you don't mind, I can just read you what the Act says. And that's identification of a pit bull. And it says a document purporting to be signed by a member of a College of Veterinarians of Ontario stating that the dog is a pit bull within the meaning of the Act is receivable in evidence in a prosecution for an offense as proof. And similarly, when a proceeding is taken, when a, and I'm going to read a different section of the Act, when a proceeding, uh, when the court finds that a dog is a pit bull, and, sorry, that's, well, there, there's also a reverse onus provision. And if it is alleged in any proceeding under the section that a dog is a pit bull, the onus of proving that the dog is not a pit bull lies with the owner of the dog in, in that proceeding. So generally speaking, the issue would be is if, if there is a certificate from a vet suggesting that it is a pit bull, then that's evidence that it is. And after that, if, there would have to be... If there is documentation that, that the dog owner has provided that says it is in fact not a pit bull, what is the... and and our staff, uh, in, in that don't case, believe I, it or yeah. question it or um, how, how is it that we, wh what process would follow that? I believe that would have to be dealt with on a case by case basis. But the, as a municipality and, and as a animal services, we have within the legislation an opportunity or the right to challenge the documentation. S 
so I, I'm not sure if I follow that, um, Councillor. Um, normally, we're not in the position of challenging. Uh, I'm just not sure I understand that question. Well, the, the dog owner provides some documentation. It says from a veterinarian, this is the, the animal in, in their estimation is not a pit bull, a, a pit bull under a definition of the act. Yeah, I do, do want to make sure that? we're not uh, this council speaking to a matter before the courts because that, I, as I'm we know, is illegal. I understand. This is a question about process. I'm trying to understand how our staff, what what legislative authority they have in terms of process, and how we undertake that. Uh, Essentially what happens is if we have evidence to the contrary, uh, when we, in fact, it's not a challenge, but we, um, the evidence, and I'm not sure what the legal term is, um, but essentially, particularly if we have compelling evidence that suggests otherwise from the report, then we, we can proceed to hold the, or seize the, uh, the animal. So there is a, a, an opportunity for us to challenge and an opportunity for the uh, for the homeowner and the dog owner to appeal. Uh, that's again where the dog owner's liability act is is uh, somewhat rigid in that there is no appeal mechanism, unfortunately, that exists within the act. Okay. And, and so that's that puts uh, you know any municipality in a, in a situation. Just to uh, provide some uh, additional commentary, uh, I appreciate the uh, interest of members of council in uh, getting a sense of what our uh, standard practice is. And I would say that it is a very, very difficult piece of legislation uh, for uh, all municipalities, not just the city of Brampton, uh, to enforce. The uh, legislation is pre prescriptive in many ways and ambiguous in many others. And it leaves our uh, staff team with a very delicate balancing act of uh, ensuring the safety of the community, respecting and uh, acknowledging the interests of the family and the dog owner affected, and to ensure that as uh, municipality that we are fully compliant with the provincial legislation and discharging our responsibilities as expected. So to your point, Councillor Moore, uh, it is, I, I, I wouldn't want you to uh, hear the staff are uh, not being definitive. We are being as definitive as we can oh. within a regime of legislation Madam, that Madam. is White City Manager, I, I so I, I think I understand your point, Councillor Moore. You were trying to say, how big is the, uh, how, how much latitude do we have and what is our standard practice? And in many, many cases, the standard practice is prescribed by legislation. In other cases, because of the specific circumstances and the fact there is no dispute resolution, our animal services staff try to find a solution that works for the municipality, that ensures we're compliant, but again, respects the interests of the homeowners. And more than anything else, I would say as uh, dog lovers, our animal services staff do whatever they can to uh, ensure that the interests of the dog uh, remain primary. Thank you, Madam City Manager. I, I, I certainly appreciate that and, and uh, I, I guess where I'm coming from is that it, um, it's important for me and other councillors to understand how our staff undertake their work so that if we are asked by members of the public, those kinds of procedures and process questions that we are in a position to give them an informed decision. And uh, that is why I have asked for the, asked the questions publicly uh, because um, it isn't, in fact, a public question, and we can't ask it 
in camera, but it is important for for me and you know as a dog lover and the few of us around the table to understand how our staff undertake their work. It is important that we have that information and that knowledge and the confidence so that when we are asked questions or we are responding to rumors or we are responding to a complaint from the community, our own constituents, we can give a reasonable response. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moore, and, and I do appreciate the confidence that you've expressed on behalf of the, the staff team. We have, uh, uh, in the past, uh, furnished members of Council with uh, briefing materials that attempt to outline uh, the restrictions and limitations and parameters uh, within provincial legislation. So I'll certainly commit to ensure that uh, uh, that maintains and updated for you. And uh, I certainly appreciate that this is uh, polarizing legislation that does uh, uh, test us all. Thank you. Councillor Callahan, then Councillor Miles, then Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Is this the uh, Michael Bryant legislation? I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. I know that it was uh, provincial legislation passed at the time that Michael Bryant was Attorney General. I think it, I think it was this. Um, is it also correct that if you have a pit bull and you, you sort of es escape the jurisdiction, go to another province, the proceedings are at an end? Um, the legislation uh, talks or speaks to exporting uh, outside of Ontario, it only applies to Ontario uh, residents. So even if you leave the province, it doesn't get you a commutation of your penalty. Just to be clear, a, a pit bull may be exported out of the province if there is, a, you know, circumstances that, uh, um, for example, if the if an owner uh, is desiring for that to happen, you can make those arrangements. So, if if an owner desires to do that, they can do that. Leave town, as it were. Yes. Okay. Um, I s was this the one that. Kathy, was this the one that we sat on a couple of councils that it was then turned over to the Citizens Committee? I know I sat on something about dogs and we... Uh, through the chair, I, I think you're talking about the Brampton Appeal Tribunal. Okay, that's yeah, that's right. Where it used to right. be heard by, uh, by Committee of Council and it's now Brampton Appeal Tribunal. This is not related to that, no. Okay, so the Appeal Tribunal doesn't enlarge, enhance the rights under the Act we're talking about because there is no appeal from that that act. Is that correct? The Brampton Appeal Tribunal deals with dogs that the pound keeper may designate as dangerous, dangerous or potentially or dangerous. That is that's so it doesn't it doesn't increase or en enhance the the legislation that's under the Dog Owners Liability Act. In other words, it doesn't incorporate an appeal into that act by, by reference. I'm not I don't I can see any by your face I'm not being said I think clearly. the short answer to that is no it doesn't okay all right um, now I'm, I'm not going to say anything more because if it's under uh, in the courts we surely really shouldn't be saying any more than that. okay that's fine thank you <coughs> Councillor Miles and Councillor Gibson uh, thank you Madam Mayor you know I just wanted to say that I I do appreciate having this discussion in in a public way because there has been so many questions raised by the public in regards to this legislation and members of council really have not been able to respond to it. So at least providing clarification on policies and procedures I think um, is, is a really positive thing that we're doing today. So can a municipality in any way overrule provincial legislation. Can we say we don't agree with the province and we're not gonna, going to abide by the legislation? The short answer is is no. I mean, certainly you probably want to do that in many cases, not just this one. So, and if, if um, a particular animal was seized by um, 
animal control believe to be um, a pit bull? Could this council go to you and say, set it free? No. I'm always hesitant to say what council can and can't do. It would be illegal to do so. So legally, it would be it would be contrary to the provincial law. There is a provision in the law that prohibits uh, someone from transferring a pit bull. So if a if a dog is uh, believed to be a pit bull and the and somebody, including a municipality, was to transfer it to someone else, then they would be in violation of the provincial law. So it, it would be illegal for us to. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Gibson. Council Miles started touching on what I was going to ask in the last anyway. If, it, if I was planning on tonight, let me know. Can you um, clarify what the elected officials' role is or is not within the legislature? I, I, I think to answer your question, the role of council would be to ask questions like council is doing today as the representatives of the community and overseeing the actions of staff to ask questions on behalf of residents to monitor staff to ensure that staff are doing their best uh, to uh, uphold obligations and duties under law. Once charges are laid, in any cases is council allowed to interfere with that? With respect to any charges under the Provincial Offenses Act, we have a memorandum of understanding with the province and it is uh, prohibited for council to become involved. Sorry, in can you repeat that? Prohibited. Prohibited. Prohibited for council to be involved in Thank any you. decisions relating to Provincial Offenses I, Act I just charges. think it's important that the public understand, understand that. Thank you. There are no further speakers. Thank you for clarifying that it's prohibited for elected people to comment on matters before the court. As such, the emails and communications have been directed to uh, be responded to by one central source, but no different than other matters before the court. Thank you for clarifying that um, because there seems to be a sense that we can do things. We're now at public question period. Well, we can, sorry, I want to finish that sentence, but we can uh, do things that are uh, prescribed in law that we cannot. And uh, we are bound by an oath of office and we're bound by provincial legislation for a municipality. Our laws are created by the province and we, have to, we are required in law to administer them. We are also the administrators of the Provincial Offenses Court, so any matter before the court, we as elected people are prohibited from becoming involved in, whether it's a parking ticket or uh, some of the conversations that we've been having directed today. You can be sure lots of people have opinions, but we're disallowed in law to engage as elected people. So thank you for that clarification. Public question period. Uh, council are now at the portion of the agenda where uh, any person who wants to come forward and speak to any matter before this council today can ask a question for clarification. Seeing none, we move to the bylaws. Councillor Hutton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Moore that bylaws 26-2010 to 45-2010 before council at its regular meeting of February 10, 2010 be given the required number of readings taken by the mayor, the city clerk, and the corporate seal affixed there too. All those in favor of the bylaws as presented. Thank you, that's carried. The uh, next motion is a motion to move into camera to deal with items T1, which is a note to file, T2, which is potential litigation, T3, which is potential litigation. All those in favor of moving into closed session. Thank you, that's carried. Council, at the close of closed session, we will come back to do the confirming bylaw. 
and then we will reconvene our meetings on Wednesday, February 24 at 1 p.m. and then Wednesday, March 10 at 1 p.m. Uh, this weekend is Valentine's Day. It's also Family Day. It's also Winterfest at Chinkuzi Park. Please have a wonderful Valentine's Day and I hope you take advantage of the many activities offered by the City of Brampton on this nice long weekend. Council, if we could now move into closed session.